on today's Run to the Top podcast. We do not see any injuries that are directly associated with increasing the distance over 20 miles and up to 26 or even 29. And the reason we don't tend to see that is that the run, walk, run really erases that buildup of stress on the weak link. But the theory back in the 70s was that if you're going to hit the wall by running 20 miles, then by building up to 26, you don't have to hit the wall. We found that people tend to hit the wall within about a mile of the distance that they ran on long runs within the last three weeks. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast from Runners Connect, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. Together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by Runners Connect. So last week we heard from Mary Wittenberg, the CEO of Virgin Sport and the former president of the New York Roadrunners. No big deal. Mary told us about her exciting new venture with Virgin Sport and she enjoyed the chat so much that the next day she offered to do another one. So stay tuned because she might be coming back on. That was pretty cool for me. Today we have another running legend, this time one who wears more hats than anyone I know. He offers running retreats, a race weekend, training plans, and even has a style of running named after him. Not many people can say that. And actually thinking about it, he might be the only one that can say that. When it comes to coaching programs, you don't get much bigger than Jeff Galloway. And he's someone I've wanted to talk to for a while now. Chatting to him today was just fascinating hearing his insights from his time as an Olympian to what he is doing today for the next generation of runners. So before I ramble on too much, there's enough from me. Let's go meet Jeff. Thank you to Sokani for supporting the Run to the Top podcast. Running might be a low maintenance sport, but a good pair of running shoes is a must. Use coupon code TINA for 10% off at Sokani.com when you pick out your next pair. I want to say a big thank you to Body Health for sponsoring this podcast and for helping me with my training over the last few years. You can enter to win a pack of six perfect amino bottles for free by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Jeff. Great to be here, Tina. I am so excited to have you on and uh, this is kind of an exciting for me getting to talk to you after you know, reading about you over all these years, I've learned so much about you and now actually getting to talk to you in person. This is, this is just wonderful. You know, you're known as being one of the biggest coaches in the running world and I want to go into your coaching, but first I kind of want to start with your background because it's interesting in itself. So maybe you could give us a kind of dive into some of your favorite moments as a runner yourself. Well, my whole career started very, very at a low level. I was a fat, lazy kid who (laughs) went to a new school where they required boys to go out for strenuous athletics after school. And uh, I didn't have any skills. I didn't have any conditioning. And my friends who were also lazy said that winter cross country was the easy mark because you could lie to the coach and tell him you're going to run on trails in the woods. <laughs> and all you did is run out to the woods 200 yards and hide out. I've heard of that. And yeah. <laughs> I, I did that for two days. And then an older kid that I liked came up to me and said, Galloway, you're going to run with us today. I was going to reach the edge of the woods, grab my hamstring and limp, but <laughs> they were funny. So uh, I wanted to stay up for the jokes and Then they started in on the gossip about the other kids. Well, I didn't make it very far at all the first day, but these kids were fun. And I went out for the social aspect of it, and I discovered two things immediately within the first week. First, even on the days when I was physically destroyed, which was most of the days during the first month, I felt better in my head and in my spirit than I had ever felt in my life. And the second thing was the friendships that I developed with these kids were were honest, trusting friendships, and I'd never had that before either. Well, we're still friends to this day, and this became a pattern 
for all of the groups and the retreats and things that I do to bring people in and help them experience these wonderful things. The highlights of my career, I improve very slowly. Um, I did not even qualify to get into the state championships in Georgia until my senior year. So I was five years of working hard and, and didn't really see a lot of improvement. And then in college, I went to a non-scholarship college, Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And mm-hmm. I just went there for the academics and the chance to have a team to run with. And it was just a wonderful four years in that regard. But ironically, in the class behind me, uh, a runner enrolled named Amby Burfoot, who mm-hmm. during his senior year won the Boston Marathon and later became editor-in-chief of Runner's World. And then two years later, Bill Rogers joined us. And so at the time, a school that did not offer scholarships had three of us there. (laughs) And it it was all serendipitous, and it was wonderful. So that was a real highlight. Then the last two summers of my college career, I went to a Navy officer program because I – It was during the draft years, and I was number three, so I was going to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I enlisted in the Navy, and running in a relay race during officer training, I met a guy who became my best friend in life, Jeff Hollister, who was a little bit later, just about a year later, the third employee at Nike. Wow. And we stayed in, in touch and did so many interesting projects together over the years. And it was from him that I got the idea of opening up my running store. So my running store, Fidipides, in Atlanta is another highlight uh, of my career. I opened that store not really with the idea of trying to sell millions of shoes, but mm-hmm. to help people get into running, get into fitness, get into walking, and experience these wonderful benefits that I was experiencing. To make a living, uh, of course, there had to be some type of income coming in. And so we developed that store, Pedipides, and we still have that store and another one in Atlanta where we are devoted to the customer that comes in. Other highlights, I helped my father get into running at the age of 52 wow. and ran with him in his last marathon when he was 75 years old. It was the Boston Marathon. Amazing. We ran the whole way together. One of the, the key highlights, though, occurred, two of them occurred during my Olympic trials experience. I was really not expected to make the Olympic team. Mm-hmm. I was ranked about, oh, maybe eight. 8 to 10th in the marathon, and they ran the the schedule of the Olympic Games in 1972. So they had the track events were done first, and then one week after the 10K, the marathon was run. So I hadn't even qualified for the the 10K until two weeks before the trials, and Mm -hmm. I had been training at altitude out in Vail, and I'm a total believer in uh, altitude training. I came down and, and set a two-minute PR in the 10K and qualified wow. to get in trials. So I, I was still ranked 12th in that race, and um, I realized that I had little or no chance of, of making the team. And it was a very hot day, so I started out in last place and stayed that way for a mile. And then the other runners that had go- who had gone out too fast on that 90-degree day were coming back to me because they had spent their resources. And I passed one after another and just made it a game to pass the next person. And it wasn't until a little more than four miles left in the race that I did an accounting and realized that I was in third place. Uh, my teammate, Frank Shorter, was in first, my, my uh, teammate on the uh, Florida Track Club. And then my mm-hmm. other teammate, Jack Batchelor, who I also trained in Vail with for two months, was in second, and I passed Jack with about a mile and a half to go and and finished second, and uh, Frank was first. Both of us waited at the finish line because Jack was in third place, 
And uh, coming up on him fast was a runner who was the son of the mayor of Eugene, Oregon, where the trials were being held. And the crowd was going just wild. And he was responding well to it. Well, he passes Jack with 30 yards to go. And Jack was weaving. He was so exhausted. And he, he bumps this fellow, John Anderson, uh, and a, a official, race official, disqualifies Jack. I, wow. I've never seen that in a distance race before or since, but it happened then. The significance is that had I qualified in the marathon a week later, I would have dropped out of the 10K to help my teammate move up and let him run in the Olympics, but that wasn't possible anymore. So Jack and I had several runs together in which we talked over strategy to try to help him qualify for the marathon. I was a very good pacer, and he was not. He tended to go out too fast. So we set a pace. I was just really a metronome in staying right on that pace. And we moved up from 100th place, and and then uh, by 21 miles, we moved into a tie for third. Uh, it was really a weird situation for me. It was my first race at that Olympic trials level, and I was at the peak of my career. We had paced ourselves well. We had trained in Florida, so we were used to the heat. It was another hot day. Mm-hmm. And I had to be Jack's cheerleader and, and look out. And so we ran together into the stadium. And at the finish line, I dropped back so that Jack could be the official qualifier. And that really was just an amazing experience for me. And yeah. it gave me so much that I, uh, I drew off of. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, that's amazing. And thank you so much for sharing all of that. And especially that story right at the end there. And and one thing that kind of came to my mind when you were talking about that, about, you know, you would have dropped out to help a teammate, you dropped back like that w- with Jack and kind of let him have it. Do you see that same kind of camaraderie with elite and professional runners now? Or do you think that's less of the case? Like, Nowadays, um, it's kind of such a like cutthroat world. Do you think people would still do that, you know, in this kind of situation with teammates, or do you think it's kind of like everyone's out for themselves? Well, you know, I meet a number of really good people at the elite level. Mm-hmm. Always have, but things have changed. I mean, now we've got prize money, and people are making their living off of running. Mm-hmm. That was not the case for us back then. There were no sponsorships. There was no prize money. Uh, And ironically, there wasn't any hope of being (laughs) able to make a living off running. Mm -hmm. And so now Frank Shorter, Bill Rogers, uh, uh, Amby Burfoot, myself, and others who were in that era have really made our careers off running very ironically, but we didn't win prize money. And, And so now, with prize money on the line, it's very unlikely that you're going to see athletes do what I did. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I love doing that. He, Jack was just a great friend, and it, it was really it gave me a lot back. Yeah, that's so special. And how was it having like a group of you? Like you said, you all kind of made a living out of it. But how was it kind of having that group of guys that all wanted, you know, to be their best. Like you said, you didn't have the prize money kind of like almost tainting things. So what was it like for you just having a group to kind of work with? Because you don't see that very often anymore with a big group kind of working together, especially at the level you were all at. That's true. The Florida Track Club was one of the first elite level postgraduate training groups in our country. There were a lot of other ones overseas, uh, in, in Europe particularly, but we did draw off one another. I mean, we we were in it to just be the best that we could be, mm-hmm. and, and there really wasn't a whole lot of bragging. As a matter of fact, I, I never heard any of my Florida Track Club teammates brag unless they were being funny about something. So we were in it to improve. We were trying to learn. We were picking up things from one another. We were drawing off the strengths of one another when one uh, of our members did well, and then we would help others when they needed help. So it was a great time, Uh, Mm -hmm. but things have changed a lot, and uh, it's very possible that an individual 
will be able to help a teammate. But when there's prize money in the line, things do change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And is that the reason you, I mean, you may not have an answer for this, but do you have a theory on why there aren't more big groups of people that, you know, do want to kind of say, all right, we're going to get together here. We're going to do everything together. Do you think it's, do people have their own coaches and they want to stick to their coaches? Is it a location thing? Is it a money thing? Do you have any theories on that? Well, uh, partially, it's, uh, I mean, most of it is what you've already said, because at the age that the professional athletes are now, and the fact that they've established a relationship, usually with a coach, Mm -hmm. they're going to tend to gravitate towards the place they like to train and the coach that they like to train with. Now, in, in my case, I didn't have a coach. I was self-coached. I just learned from others. I would talk to any great coach like Bill Bowerman that I could have access to. And my friend Jeff Hollister helped me gain that access. And Bill and I became friends. It was a a wonderful uh, relationship there. Mm -hmm. He was my Olympic coach. And that was a, a wonderful time there. But I think that where the great opportunity for team training would be, would be at an earlier time in their life. For example, during high school mm-hmm. or just after high school. And there are a number of programs. I know Alberto Salazar has one yeah. that uh, take talented kids and uh, through Nike support is able to uh, provide a good package for them to mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this this could evolve, and there is no doubt that when you have a stable of good runners, you can get really some really good workouts if the coach is monitoring the effort level, making sure that athletes aren't running over their head in workouts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, I've, I've seen plenty of that, and I think uh, hopefully by now most of the listeners know that um, – that is one of the biggest things that comes to bite any runner, we, be it what, whatever level you are, it's the it's the doing too much and a coach is the important part in being able to hold that back and kind of keep you in line. So just for, you know, everyday runners, recreational runners, do you recommend they train in groups? Is this something that kind of across the board, running with a group, having a, a group of people who are going for the same goal helps? There's no doubt about that. And that has been another, that after I gave up my competitive career, I've received more gratification and exhilaration from working with others and seeing this. And so through our Galloway training groups around the country, which I visit often, and the retreats that I do, the weekend retreats in which people come together in small groups, and we have these runners, just these everyday runners, wanting to learn. They soak up the method like a sponge and they're so willing to listen and apply what they've learned that they also stay in touch. And and so they get back to me and say, look, because of what I learned here at this uh, Carmel retreat, here's Mm -hmm. what I've been able to do. We've actually expanded our retreats. We're just opening a new one in Carmel at the end of March. And the reason we've expanded is there is so much interest in getting individual help Mm -hmm. with running and learning hands-on, how do you do these drills? What is my form like? Am I doing something wrong? I do individual form evaluations. So not only do you have, uh, as you mentioned, the chance for everyday runners to come together as a team and, and sort of pull one another along, but I can then guide them and keep them from doing things that cause injuries. Yeah, and I think that is a big part of it. And I think, you know, that's what I'd love to kind of talk about now is you mentioned about your training groups, and I would like to talk about the retreats in a little while and the importance of those. But tell us about, you know, you have over 100 training groups in the US and around the world. And maybe you could share a little bit about that, you know, for people who don't know anything about this, what they can do to kind of get involved. Well, the the reason that I even started these groups, it was a direct request from people that came in 
my running store, Fidipides, and said, look, I really would like to have a group to train with. And so we uh, stumbled around at first, but after a few months, we settled on a way of segmenting people into groups based on their current ability level. And we use a component in our training called the Magic Mile. It Mm -hmm. is amazing. It's got more than 65,000 instances of people who've reported in their fastest magic mile and then their fastest times in other races. So having crunched the numbers, we can tell people what their potential is going to be during the next six months so that they don't go for a goal that's really not realistic. Mm -hmm. And then we can set up a safe long run pace so that they don't overdo it. So what that means in our training program is that we can group the greyhounds with the greyhounds, the snails Mm -hmm. with the snails, and then the other critters with their own kind. (laughs) And it it makes it fun because we're slowing the long runs down uh, so that everybody can talk, everybody can tell jokes, and it pulls one another along. The other unique, well, there are two other unique elements. One is that we go at least up to the distance of the race on long runs within about three weeks before the race itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, In in the marathon, we go up to at least 26. and time goal people, we go up to 29. But we slow the pace down to a pace that's normally about four to five minutes per mile slower than current 5K pace. Because we found that people get the same endurance regardless of how slow you go. But the faster you go, the more likely it is that you're going to be exhausted, you're going to burn out, you're going to dread the next long run, and you're going to get injured. And as soon as you slow that pace down and put the appropriate walk breaks in there, then you've really got a chance to get all the endurance without the pain. The other unique element is our run, walk, run. Mm -hmm. And we have evolved this based on the feedback now from over half a million runners uh, giving me direct feedback. Just before I ha- I want to talk about the walk run in a second and I this is something I really want to focus on for a second but just so I can clarify there you have the runners do you said 26 to 29 miles for a marathon 3 weeks before the race so they will do but at a slower pace you you I just want to get that clear you did say that. Yeah. Okay, so but then um, and- how does that not stop people being out there for like you know, let's say they're a five and a half hour marathoner and if they're slowing down their pace, like maybe just explain the theory on that. If that means people are out there for, you know, six, seven hours, like what are your, th- what's your thinking with that? Well, it, it, again, it is really based on more than 40 years of using this in mm-hmm. our training programs. Uh, first of all, we do not see any injuries that are directly associated with increasing the distance over 20 miles and up to 26 or even 29. And and the reason we don't tend to see that is that the run, walk, run really erases that buildup of stress Mm -hmm. on the weak links. But the theory back in the 70s was that if you're going to hit the wall by running 20 miles, then by building up to 26, you don't have to hit the wall. And that's exactly what we found. We found that people tend to hit the wall within about a mile of the distance that they ran on long runs within the last three weeks. Hmm. And so by going the distance, not only do people feel strong and have more belief that they can do it, but they actually run faster. The Mm -hmm. average improvement when a person used to run 20 miles as their longest and then go up to our recommendation 26, the average improvement is 15 minutes in numerous surveys we've done. And those who want to qualify for Boston or uh, set a PR and go up to 29, the difference between just 26 and 29, only three miles more, is an average of 11 minutes faster. Hmm, So there's a huge amount of time improvement from just lengthening the long run. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's probably a lot of it, you know, then the only thing you're adding on race day is the you know running faster whereas otherwise you kind of have to get used to running further and faster on race day so 
That, that is correct. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Okay. And then one other thing um, before we do go on to talk about the walk around, which I do want you to explain it and how you came up with it and everything like that. But you mentioned the magic mile. So maybe just if you could explain that to people who may not have heard of it before, I will put a link in the show notes also, but just for people who are curious what you meant by that. Yeah, you can find out more information at jeffgalloway.com and, mm -hmm. and in my training books. Uh, such as year-round plan, but giving you the Cliff Notes version here, the idea is that you use the first magic mile mainly to set up our pace groups so that they're homogeneous in ability level, and, and that happens really well. But on each successive magic mile, which is run about every two or three weeks, the object is to run successively faster on each one. And by the end of the season you're going to see the, the faster times being produced. And then that magic mile time becomes very predictive of um, what a person's capable of doing. Based on the data, we find that runners tend to slow down 15% when they go from a magic mile time up to a per mile time in a 10K. It's a 20% slowdown in a half marathon and a 30% slowdown in a marathon. Now, that assumes that they've done all the speed training, too, mm -hmm. but at least gives them what would be a realistic prediction if they did all the training. Okay. And then when they actually come to testing their magic mile, how do they get their magic mile time? Well, when it's done in our groups, there'll be a timer out there who will give the quarter mile splits and then the final time, and then it's written down so that the uh, program director in each city can then tabulate and see who's improving, who's not, and then try to help those who are not improving. So is it and just usually, running as fast as you can for that mile? The first couple of them, you're not running as fast as you can. You're uh, On the first one, you just run a, a tiny bit faster than you usually run on a training run, just to get okay. used to the mile. Okay. And then then that allows for the uh, pacing to be set up to run faster on the second one. So you divide by four and you try to hit those quarter miles about a second to three seconds faster, depending on the individual. And then that concept continues throughout the season with each magic mile being an opportunity to strategize pacing and then to improve so that the last one or two of the magic miles is run fairly close to potential. Okay. Okay, great. And again, I will put things in the show notes about the magic mile, the link to that that Jeff talked about. So you can read more if you are interested in learning more about this and want to work with one of the groups Jeff is talking about. So then let's go on to the walk around method. You started to uh, talk about it before I rudely interrupted you. Maybe you could say, you know, how you came up with it and then your reasoning, I guess, your philosophy behind it. Well, first of all, you do this podcast so well, logically. So feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'm sure people listening are like, Tina, stop interrupting him. But <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Well, <laughs> you... <going>. you, you <laughs> circle back. So, uh, you know, and, and so in the circle back about the, mat, about the run, walk, run, uh, what we're talking about is a method that conserves resources that reduces injuries down to practically nothing and allows runners to run faster in long distances. It started in 74 when I was asked to, to teach a class in beginning running. And None of the 22 in the class had done any running for at least five years. So I knew that this was a start over type of thing. And, uh, and I went out with each group every single workout to make sure that they didn't overdo it. And uh, I would put walk breaks in before they got into heavy breathing, huffing and puffing. And then we went through that class and everybody was able to stay up with their group on practically every single run. Well, by the end of the season, every one of those beginners ran either a 5K or 10K 10 weeks later. And, and that was great. But the real thing that hit me, there were no injuries. Mm -hmm. There were no injuries in training. There were no injuries 
in the race. And we had this wonderful feeling of accomplishment that everybody had as a mm-hmm. result of that. And uh, most of them actually did run, walk, run during the race itself because they had had such good success with it. From that point on, I have evolved the run, walk, run based on feedback. And now I've received feedback from over half a million runners over the last 43 years. And what happens is someone will come to me, and now it's at the rate of 100 runners a day. They'll come to me with a problem. I'll give them a solution, and 95% of them get back to me so I can tabulate how the advice worked. So it's a reality-based adjustment that I make. And we're just now fine-tuning because the the run-walk-run strategies are really working. They're just so successful now. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I always recommend that uh, once a week that runners have a series of quarter-mile or half-mile repetitions and run them at race pace and then try a different configuration of run-walk-run on each one so that you can see which one feels good to you and and sustainable. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. And I'm sure people are going to give that a try. And I'm sure there are plenty of other ways that um, Jeff talks about this on his website for you if you are interested in giving this a try and seeing how much it can help you. And one thing that came to mind when you were talking just then was you were saying about, you know, how much it's helped people. But what would you like to say to runners who kind of still have that, I'm sure you come across this often, that kind of social stigma against walking and running? Running is for running. I don't want to walk. I'm 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 not going to walk. That's that's for, you know, beginners. I'm not a beginner anymore. So what would you like to say to people who kind of have that thing against taking walk breaks during their run and maybe how it can benefit everyone or, you know, when you should keep it in your training? The first thing I say is, good for you. You are the captain of your ship. You're the one that determines how you're going to run, whether you're going to take walk breaks or that you don't want to take walk breaks. That's your prerogative. That is the most wonderful aspect of running. Mm -hmm. We have the freedom to do it the way that we want to do it. Now, the benefits, though, are very clear to me because of the database that I have received. And um, the benefits are you can reduce injury rate down to practically zero. You can run faster in a marathon. Former nonstop runners who find the right run, walk, run, tend to improve an average of more than 13 minutes. And then the other major thing is recovery, particularly after long runs. The ability to do a 26 or 29-mile run Mm -hmm. and not have that interfere with family, friends, career, or anything else. It's simply incredible. My wife Barbara and I have been running marathons, well, in my case, for well over 50 years, and I used to be really out of commission for a week or two after a marathon. I was running nonstop. Today, we run a marathon every month, and we can run the next day. We can do anything we want to that evening. It's simply amazing the stories I hear from average people, beginners, that pick up the right run, walk, run, do a marathon, and they feel so good that they bring their family members and co-workers mm-hmm. into it because it's exhilarating to be able to get that empowerment. Mm-hmm. And does the amount of walking for each person differ, or is it kind of, you know, you start with more walk breaks and as you get more advanced you take less, or do you kind of see it uh, almost go up and then down? So, you know, at the very beginning people take a lot of walk breaks and then people kind of take less walk breaks as they get fitter and then kind of take more again once they get faster? Like, how does that work with the the duration of the walk breaks? Well, the beginners should be taking liberal walk breaks just to allow the body to adapt. Uh, We work with a lot of beginners in our training programs and at our retreats who tried running before, but they ran mostly nonstop and they broke down Mm -hmm. and they assumed that running wasn't for them. And then they discovered my method. And so they come to the retreat because I can set it up individually for them. And it's just one of these eureka moments. You know, I 
I get all of the wonderful good brain benefits of running, but I'm not wiped out. This is wonderful. So it's it's really one of those amazing tools. It's a cognitive tool. When you use a, a cognitive tool of focusing on how much running and how much walking, then you stay in your human conscious brain instead of letting the monkey brain secrete hormones that make you feel miserable. Mm-hmm. Because the human brain overrides the monkey brain, and so even maybe, under stress, I just want to pause you. Tell us what the monkey brain is while you're going. Well, we have two different brain operating systems as humans. We have the ancient subconscious monkey brain and our poor little human brain. The monkey brain has a million times processing capability compared with our monkey brain, and so we use the monkey brain for a lot of the things that we do, particularly things that we've trained ourselves to do, like running. So if we allow the monkey brain to be in control of a run, then at first everything's fine, but as we start to build up stress and the monkey brain is in control, the way it monitors stress is to secrete anxiety hormones once the stress level gets to a certain point. And then when it rises above that, the negative attitude hormones start coming in. This is why you can uh, get halfway through a run or so and you were motivated, you were feeling good a few minutes before, and all of a sudden you're questioning whether you really can finish that run. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon you feel so miserable you don't want to finish the run. Now, you don't have to do away with the stress, do away with the hormones. You simply have to have a cognitive strategy. And run, walk, run is a cognitive strategy. So you reduce the amount of running so that you know you can do it. Mm -hmm. That turns on the belief circuit in your conscious brain. And the conscious brain overrides the monkey brain, so no hormones are going to be produced while you're under its control. Now, you ask about how then to set up the strategy for individuals. It's really based on pace per mile. For example, for a nine-minute per mile pace, uh, the most popular is run two minutes and then walk 30 seconds. For 10 minutes per mile, it's 90-30. For 11 and 12 minutes per mile, it's 60 seconds run and 30 seconds walk. And then with uh, 13 and 14 minutes per mile, it's 30 seconds, 30 seconds, or 20-20, or 15-15. My wife, Barb, and I use 15-15 on all of our marathons because we've tried them all. And for us, that's what works best. So we set up what we call a rule of thumb that I've just mentioned to you, strategies. But we certainly encourage runners to try other configurations. And the new trend in the last couple of years has been to find some quirky ones that work for you uh, Mm -hmm. on a given day. So Let's say that someone started out at 60-30, but later on they find that 48-25 works better for them. <laughs> and, and this is great because each person is the captain of their ship. Okay. I love that. Thank you so much for describing and explaining. That's really helpful. It makes it very clear in our minds. And I'm sure you're you're helping people so much there. And one thing you mentioned um, with the breaks that kind of I was a little bit surprised by is with those walk breaks. So they're very short, you know, um, maybe max, I'm guessing of 45 seconds. You're not talking like two minutes of running, two minutes of walking, or even like five minutes of running and three minutes of walking. Like these are very short, less than a minute breaks. Is that correct? That is correct. We're finding, and and we've really zeroed in on the research over the last 12 years about how long a walk break needs to be in order to uh, give the maximum benefit. And I found that for most people, it's 30 seconds. And if you walk longer than 30 seconds, you're actually going to tend to slow down during the second half of a a long run. Interesting. Uh, And it becomes harder and harder to restart again after the walk break. So the idea then becomes shorten the run portion, which, of course, produces less fatigue on the legs, and then shorten the walk portion. And so that's why these shorter segments have come up. The surprising thing is uh, since we uh, went national in reducing the walk break down to no more than 30 seconds, we're finding some significant time improvements. Mm. For example, uh, someone who used to run three minutes and walk one, when they shift 
to a 90-second run, 30-second walk, there's an average of more than four minutes of time improvement in wow. a half marathon. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. And something I, <laughs> that's, that's amazing that it makes that much of a difference as well. This is really insightful to see. And, and, you know, I can even thinking to myself about um, my own training when I was in college and I was racing 5k, 10k, I used to do uh, a workout that was 24 by 400, which sounds crazy. And, you know, I'd have a very short break in between and they weren't particularly fast. I mean, obviously faster than easy run, but it, it sounded really hard, but by breaking it up in that way, and even though it was only a short break and it, you know, wasn't anywhere near enough to kind of recover, but it was just enough to kind of get in a rhythm and go. And I, that I actually found those were my favorite kind of training sessions. And, and so even, you know, at that level, when I was running, you know, in low 16 minute for a 5k, I found that that kind of workout was the biggest confidence boost. So even thinking myself, you know, for people listening, thinking, oh, well, you know, once you get to a certain level, you don't need this anymore. Well, it could well pay off trying something like this. So thank you for explaining this in so much detail. This has been very helpful. One thing I wanted to ask that kind of uh, came to me and I thought was quite funny is, um, you know, this has been kind of named to the Galloway method. And I just wonder to you if you feel like you, you know, you kind of made it when uh, something, a method is named after you and you kind of become its own like little phenomenon. So was that a, ever a strange moment for you when you realized just how, how big this had become with so many people? Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm just simply honored uh, that, that people refer to it that way. And part of it is that I'm uh, really about the only national or international coach that that advocates this. And of course, I've been advocating it for more than 40 years. So it's not any new thing on the horizon here. But I have put so much of myself into this that people often tell me that they feel my personality. When they talk to somebody about it, they find themselves reciting things that, that they picked up from me. And again, I feel honored by that. It's just a wonderful feeling uh, yeah. Runners share a togetherness in wanting to help other people, and I'm so pleased that so many people today are helping friends and family members by using my method. Yeah, and and I, I'm sure that is the case. But um, you know, people even hearing today, you can hear how much time and effort you've put into this, so it's kind of been worth it. And and you know, um, that's been proved even further by this is works out as a perfect segue. You now have the Jeff Galloway race weekend. So now not only do you have a uh, training method named after you and training programs and everything, but you also have a whole race weekend. So how did how did that part feel? Was it, you know, obviously another honor, but how was it kind of having a whole event series around you and what you've done? The uh, training groups years ago, going back 25 years, would regularly ask me, you know, we need to have our own race. We need to have our own Galloway race. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of things on my plate during those years. And it's only been during the last four years that I had developed the staffing in our Atlanta office that had the experience to be able to put on a high-level race, a very well-organized race, and I felt totally confident in doing that. And so it's a wonderful thing. We have people all over the world who are wanting to come to Atlanta. Now, the reality is that a lot of them can't come on the date, on any given date that you would put up there. So that's why we, we have the virtual. But during the weekend... It's a wonderful series of activities, uh, and I yeah. wanted to show off Atlanta. We have mm -hmm. uh, our course is very historic. It goes by the Margaret Mitchell House, the Jimmy Carter Library, the Martin Luther King Center, and just a lot of our storied landmarks in Atlanta in a beautiful section of Midtown Atlanta. It finishes with two miles in our really great park, Piedmont Park. But the virtual allows people to be a part of this, mm -hmm. to win their medal, win the T-shirt by running a race or a training run uh, documented by 
mapping in wherever they are. So we have people in Afghanistan and Africa and and distant parts of the globe who will check in with us uh, with their report of their run. Mm -hmm. And it's just wonderful to see people tied together all over the world through this event. Mm -hmm. No, I could see that. And, and, you know, that again, just shows even, even that, that you are so passionate about it and you just want to help and you just want to make running better for people and make it an experience to remember. And I, I love the idea of the virtual part of it. I mean, that just adds a whole new element to it. And then you also mentioned even the retreats. This is another part you've taken it. And I'd love to kind of talk about those for a few minutes here. From what I was reading, it was Athens, Florida, there's a few in California and Rome, if that's correct. So maybe tell us a bit more about what those involve, if people are interested in those. We have had some changes in the, uh, particularly the international retreats in, in my involvement because I have contracts with uh, Run Disney and, and other uh, race contracts. And so this year, we are not going to be able to do our involvement with uh, Rome or or Italy, and I regret that, but that's just the way the schedule goes. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, we have regular retreats in Carmel, California. I have one a year at Lake Tahoe during the summer, and then we have several down on the panhandle of Florida between Destin and Panama City. It's in western uh, part of the panhandle there. Uh, But what what happened, this, this whole thing evolved, again, out of my store. People would come in and say, uh, where did you train for the Olympics? And I I would often tell them during that era of my first few years in the store, I uh, opened the store in 73, and people would come in. They had heard that I was on the Olympic team and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we'd talk about my training, and I explained going up to high altitude train. They said, uh, you know, I think I'd like to do that. And I got a, enough of a critical mass of people who were very keen on wanting to do that that I decided to give it a try in 1975. And so I started, my first one was at Lake Tahoe because I had run up there and I knew how beautiful it was mm-hmm. and how amazing the trails were up there. And it worked. Uh, we've held our retreat up there every year except for one year sense. And it's just what we look forward to most all year round Mm -hmm. because it's a full week. The other retreats are weekends. And to be up at Lake Tahoe in the summer with 10% humidity and Mm -hmm. uh, gorgeous views uh, when you go out for a run is just something that I, I see people light up when they get there. And how then they coast off the momentum of that week for months afterwards. Mm -hmm. No, I would believe it. And uh, actually, one of my uh, closest friends, uh, Sarah Crouch and her husband, Michael, uh, they lived in Lake Tahoe for a year or two, I believe. And they were always talking about how beautiful it was and how um, it was their favorite place to live just because they couldn't believe that it wasn't more, uh, there weren't more people there because it was just, they just, thought it was amazing and it's nice to hear you talk about it in that same same way that they do so kind of cool i will put information to the retreats and about your training method about all the all these different things that you um offer and it's just amazing what you've managed to do with this almost empire that you've created around you it's it's just so so cool to hear and i'll put links in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc151 So I had one other question for you before we get on to the final kick round. Actually, I had a lot of questions left for you, but um, I'm just going to pick one. And that would be, do you have a favorite race that you have done over the years other than your weekend that you would (laughs) recommend all runners do, you know, worldwide or where they where they could go to, you know, that you just whether it be a peach tree or, um, you know, a gate river, if there was something like that, that you recommend everyone should do at least once. Well, if you've run a lot of races, you realize that they're like children. They're they're different, you know. <laughs> yeah. And some uh, there are a number of them that were just simply wonderful, but but they are wonderful in different ways. Uh, when it comes to beauty, it just doesn't get any better than the Big Sur Marathon, and and it's just it's gorgeous scenery, 
it, the weekend there is, is special too because of where it is. That's where I really got intrigued with Carmel, and mm-hmm. it is the reason why we now do separate retreats because there's no more beautiful place in the world to run than mm-hmm. out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the hospitality and the ability for all family members to find something that they really like when you go to your race, the Walt Disney World or Disneyland, the Run Disney races, they they just offer so much in the way of entertainment, fun, uh, great expo, uh, great chance to bring others who don't run but can still have a fabulous time during mm-hmm. that whole weekend. And, of course, Disney provides... They spoil you because they <laughs> yep. provide for the transportation and everything. And then for the overall experience, even though Barb and I cannot go to this um, tour anymore, but the Apostolos tour to Athens, Greece. And the reason that I, I went on that tour 17 years, and it, the, uh, the tour director, Paul Samaras, it, he's like a father hen. He, he makes sure that... Mm-hmm. Everything's taken care of. And, of course, in a foreign country, there are a lot of things that could go wrong. And he he makes them work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's so fun, the social stuff and great place to stay and takes care of all the transportation, picking you up at the airport, taking you back. Anyway, uh, so the, the crowning touch of that event is that it's on the original course. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it you, you just feel a part of marathon history when you're there. Yeah, no, that's so cool. And definitely that one is, well, actually all of those are on my bucket list of someday doing, but that one especially sounds just, you know, once one you've got to do at some point in your life lifetime. Um, okay, well, we're just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and then we will be right back with the final kick round. This is the time of year many of us commit to being better and doing what we can to reach our goals. For me, it's doing more stretching and mobility work, and you've heard me admit it here, so hold me to it. But once the busyness of life, the nasty weather, and the tiredness from training accumulates in our legs, that motivation slips away, and it can be really hard to get it back. Now, we could reward ourselves with food, but after all that indulging over the holidays, most of us probably need to work on making better choices. We all know that new running shoes or new running clothes have a bit of a power to get us excited about running again, especially if they look stylish. The Saucony Freedom ISO has become my new favourite shoe, not just because they're nice to look at, but because the Ever Run soul gives back with every step. So even on my most tired day, I feel like I'm getting a little bit of a push from the ground. I absolutely love them and I think you will too. So if you live in the US, make sure you use coupon code TINA to get 10% off your order at Saucony.com. By now, you've probably heard me talk about how a Body Health Perfect Amino is the perfect blend of the eight essential amino acids to help you build and repair your muscles, your tissues, and of course, improve recovery. I take it along with their complete plus detox multivitamin. And during my recent marathon build-up, I took Perfect Amino a few times a day, which allowed me to bounce back from my workouts quicker and to keep training hard so I could have a good race in the fall, which is kind of important, right? Have you used coupon code TINA10 yet? The Body Health team would love to hear your feedback. Yes, another reason I love them. And you can share your experience with Perfect Amino through the show notes for this episode by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. Oh, and you can enter to win a six pack worth $230 there too. So once again, that link is runnersconnect.net forward slash body health. I wish you all the luck. Okay, Jeff, just five more little questions for you. Um, Actually, I did have, like I mentioned, so many more, but we've kind of run out of time. So um, I want to start with the greatest advice you've ever received. Greatest advice? Well, that's (laughs) actually pretty simple. Run your own race, run your own workout. Too many people get carried away. I made that mistake. I tried to keep up with other people early in my career. I found out that I had to do what was best for me. Yeah, absolutely. And so important. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned that one because that's one that I think more and more people are starting to learn. Okay, favorite running book or blog other than your own? Well, I I, I do want to say that mm-hmm. of my 30 books, my favorite book is at least the one that 
is influencing people more in more ways is mental training. It okay. really has an amazing impact on people, not only in coping with running challenges, but life challenges. Now, my own reading of books, I have to skew it slightly mm-hmm. uh, because I like to look into the research behind running and and things that impact running. And I have two favorites. One of them is a book called Spark that uh, gets into so many of the mental uh, benefits that running gives. Better attitude, uh, more personal empowerment, and then clearer thinking, quicker thinking, new growth of brain cells. It's a powerful book. The other one is uh, The Story of the Human Body by an evolutionary biologist from Harvard who delineates how running was just uh, incremental and very powerful impact on the development of our brain as human beings. So anyway, those are two really breakthrough books that do uh, talk a lot about running. Yep. Great. And I haven't heard of either of those, so I definitely want to uh, put those to my list as well. So thank you. Um, Okay. uh, What would you like to tell a new runner? They should get my book getting started (laughs) because you really need a guide. And uh, I have sorted through my 58 years of running now, and I have put into getting started the cognitive tools that can keep people out of trouble and allow them to achieve what they're capable of doing. But if you don't get that book, please get very good advice from somebody that has worked with thousands and thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have that perspective uh, of having worked with a whole lot of people, there are going to be some problems that usually come up. Yeah. Okay, great advice. Thank you. And what about your pre-race meal? What did you used to eat or what do you still eat? The uh, first energy bar that ever came out was the original formula of Power Bar. Mm -hmm. And that is still pretty much my go-to fuel source because I found that it digests most easily of any of the other uh, pre-race products on the market for me. And then uh, I also drank uh, a cup of coffee before, too. So the combination Mm -hmm. of of the original Power Bar, which is now called Power Bar Performance, and coffee just works so well. But for other people, I recommend use what works for you. Yeah, great. I'm glad you mentioned that as well, because uh, I've said that many times before. What works for, you know, the best person in the world is not necessarily going to work for you. You need to know what works with your stomach. Okay, and finally, your favorite running product? Well, that one is easy. (laughs) There is a product we discovered uh, about three years ago, um, the BFF. And it is because it's a vibrating massage tool and uh, it really invigorates muscles and it brings new blood flow in to help muscles recover quicker. Uh, And if you are ever interested, I can give your listeners a discount on that product because it is just so powerful. I'd love to see more people get it. Absolutely. Uh, were you able to share that discount with us now or would you like to send it You know, over the next few days and I'll put it in the show notes? I will send it to you over the next few days. Okay. All right. Then listeners, you have heard that. Uh, I will mention the show notes again. They will be at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC151. And you can only imagine the amount of products that Jeff has seen in his lifetime. So uh, with this running world and the experience that he's got. So um, make sure you do check that out. It was called the BFF massager, you said? That is correct. We call it the, the muscle buffer. (laughs) <laughs> okay all right great i'll put links in the show notes well jeff um uh, obviously people can go to jeffgalloway.com but what would be the best uh social media channel that you kind of keep up to date with that people can follow you know uh what's going on or what the latest things are we have real good um presence on facebook and okay. twitter right okay. now we're right. um we're working on instagram and we're going to rev that up in the next two weeks Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and all your wisdom. And uh, thank you for all that you do to the run- for the running world because you really have changed so many lives. So on behalf of everyone listening, thank you very much. Well, Tina, this has been my pleasure. If I can ever help you again, please let me know. Thank you. 
Is there anything that Jeff can't do? In addition to that ginormous resume of his, he is the sweetest, kindest guy, and I look forward to seeing what he comes up with next. Everything Jeff and I talked about today, you can find in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc151. We actually sat down and chatted for about 20 minutes after we ended the call, and it was kind of cool because particularly we talked about how we are both metronomes when it comes to races, and how he actually used to love doing that same 400 workout that I talked about. And I know that workout sounds scary, but honestly, it's really not as bad as you think. And if you want to give it a try, send me an email, tina at runnersconnect.net, and I can send you some more information. And if you enjoyed this episode or any other episode, I'd also love to hear from you about any feedback or any suggestions you have. And you can email me, again, I'll say that again, tina at runnersconnect.net, if you want to get through to me. I'd love to hear from you. So now is usually the time I tell you who we will be talking to next week, but I'm afraid I don't know. At the time of this recording, I've actually not set up an interview for next week, but hopefully by the time this goes live, I will have. Otherwise, our editor, Jeremy, might be kind of mad at me for leaving it to the last minute. But I've actually, when you listen to this, I will have been home in England uh, spending time with my new niece for the last month. And so I've recorded this a month ahead of time and I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I just wasn't able to get the next episode in on time. So I hope you'll bear with me and whoever this mystery guest ends up being, I hope you will tune in next week to find out. In the meantime, I truly want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for tuning in today and any other episode you listen to, your support and loyalty. And every time anyone tags me in a tweet or in an Instagram message or a Facebook post, it just warms my heart so much. So thank you so much for that. I do read each and every one and I appreciate it so much. So before I start getting too emotional, I'm going to say goodbye. So have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Run to the Top podcast from runnersconnect.net. 